Hey, uh, this is great, great, and I appreciated the uh, shout out from Pedro on, on soybean, because uh, the U of I just landed the uh, USAID's first uh, multidisciplinary project on soybean development in Africa, so we're uh, pumped up about that. So um, all soybean questions, uh, we'd love to, love to hand, uh, uh, handle them. So we have a, this is uh, session four and meeting the demand for food security, health, and wellness sustainability. Uh, Craig Gunderson, Craig is somebody, oh, there he is. Craig Gunderson um, uh, at the University of Illinois directs the National Soybean Research Laboratory. Uh, we'll be talking about bridging the international and U.S. food security research areas. Ready to roll? Okay, he's ready. Okay, I wanted to uh, begin by thanking Evan and Madhu very much for, for letting me give a presentation today. I especially like it since I don't do that much international food security, more, more domestic. So I really appreciate you letting me speak here despite that. And I wanted to thank all of you. I really appreciate everybody coming. There's lots of other things you could be doing today, and you're, you're here. So I, so, I, so I do appreciate that. So. Um, I, uh, you know, the sessions earlier today was great. I'm sorry, tomorrow I actually have to, I have to be at, at Baylor University for a, a thing on domestic food and security stuff, so I'm not going to be here tomorrow, so, so, so I apologize for that. But one thing is, is that in the um, poverty literature, there's been this divide between people doing work on U.S. poverty and people doing work on international poverty issues. And those two generally do not intersect at all. And something similar happens with the international food security literature and the domestic food insecurity literature is those two things generally, to, to the detriment of both sides, have not been informing each other. If I was giving this presentation to a group of domestic food insecurity researchers, I would be reversing this. I would be talking about how all the neat things in the international food insecurity literature could be informing the domestic food insecurity literature. Given the topic of this conference, though, I'm going to be talking about the international stuff. I'm going to be concentrating on four things. First, I'm going to talk about how the measurement of food insecurity in the U.S. can be applied elsewhere. Talking about how the determinants of uh, food insecurity in the United States, how some of these things may be relevant for other areas. Third thing is, is regarding food assistance programs, which are increasingly being used in uh, lower income countries and have a long history in the United States. And fourth, with ap apologies to, to um, Brian, who's done a lot of work in this area, I'm gonna be talking about how de jure and de facto, both, both misusing probably both those terms, we have a food safety net in the United States. And I'm gonna talk about how there might be some insights regarding that for uh, other countries. So let me begin. Now, b before beginning, let me tell you why there's huge differences between what we call food insecurity in the United States and what we call food insecurity in lower income countries. First of all, the magnitude of the problem is vastly different. Okay? The number of people affected in lower income countries is far, far higher than in um, higher income countries. The sorts of severity of experiences, like in the last presentation talking about stunting. Stunting is not something that happens in the United States due to food insecurity, but it does happen in developing countries and a lot of other cases. So the consequences, uh, so both the severity and consequences is, is worse. Some of the causes, if you see a lot of literature on you know, famines or the food insecurity in developing in, in low income countries, is political instability is one of the key determinants. In uh, higher income countries, that's, that's not the case, at least in the, um, in the last 70 perhaps years. The other thing is, is that given the well-developed markets within the United States is even if there's droughts or whatever in the United States or somewhere else, it doesn't really make any difference, whereas it may make a difference in lower income countries. The other difference is the role of farmers. Farmers in the United States, as you all know, are relatively upper income. I mean, their median incomes of farmers in the United States are higher than the median income for the population as a whole. So in terms of addressing food insecurity, Farmers really don't play a role, except, of course, for the supply side. That, of course, is something very different. But if we want to improve, address food insecurity, improving the well-being of farmers in the United States doesn't make as much sense, whereas in a lot of lower-income countries where a high proportion of the population are farmers, it may, make a, it may, may be a reason to, to, to address policies towards them. Um, and also in the United States, you know, less than what, about 1% of the population, less than 1% of the population are farmers, so it doesn't really makes sense to talk too much about farmers in that context. It's always good to talk about farmers, but we don't talk about them in this context, you know, especially soybean farmers. You've got to talk about a lot of them. But the other thing is, is that it's different is with respect to supply side issues. Okay, we have more than enough food in the United States, and this is really an issue of distribution. And so one of the speakers this morning, I mean, this is true in all countries. 
Food insecurity generally is a localized phenomenon. It's oftentimes not a national phenomenon. But in the United States, at least, is having enough food is not one of the issues that we face. And finally, I think this is critical, is the ability of a country to address. So, for example, the United States, we can, we can address the issue of food insecurity. I mean, we could, we could easily address that. But whether or not we're willing to is a separate issue. But a lot of lower-income countries, even if they realistically wanted to say, we're going to end hunger tomorrow in our country, they, they don't have the, the resources to do that given the, the, given the current situation in those countries. So when I'm talking about what we can learn from the domestic food insecurity literature, I want to be clear that I'm not saying all oh, things in the United States are bad, just like in other countries. That's not what I'm saying. So just get that out of the way. But still, I'm going to talk about what, you can, what can be learned. Okay, so here's how food insecurity is measured in the United States. It is just what's called the core food security module. And these are the questions that are for adults. So they range everything from worrying about the amount of food you have, this is the least severe, all the way up to the most severe is, this, if you look at question nine, in the last 12 months, did you or other adults in the household ever not eat for a whole day because there wasn't enough money for food? That's the most severe question pertaining to adults. So. The reason I'm putting these questions up here is that it shows that these questions are applicable to the United States, but they're also, these are the exact same questions that could be asked in other countries, and they have been. There is some great work by Ed Frangillo, who's now at University of South Carolina, who's applied these same questions in uh, Bangladesh, in Venezuela, and two other countries I'm forgetting now. So these have been applied to other countries. So this is the way we measure food insecurity amongst adults, and you can see as these could easily be applied to um, lower income countries. These are the countries, these are the same questions that are asked of children. So there's a total of 18 questions. And then, you know, the most severe question here is, in the last 12 months, did any of the children ever not eat for a whole day because there wasn't enough money for food? In the United States, Thankfully, this is very rare. Very few people respond affirmatively to this. If we thought about some low-income countries, is this could be a much higher proportion. Given these 18 questions, is these are categorized in the following way. Is there's food insecure if there's three or more affirmative responses? Now, so what that then means is, is that if you were to, earlier I talked about severity. If you were to apply this to, let's say, to Ghana, as an example, is the food insecurity rate under this criteria would probably, I would guess, would be between 70 and 80%. It would be very high. Okay? In the United States, I'm going to come to momentarily, it's about 15%. But you could, in principle, do the exact same measurement and have the same cutoff. It would just be a lot more severe. And these are some other measurements that are often used within the food insecurity literature. For example, if somebody's interested in food insecurity amongst children, is we have this very low food security measure if you have five or more affirmative responses to child-specific questions. So the first point I want to make is that these can be applicable. They have been used in, in lower-income countries, and they, they, they could be used in more countries. The other thing is that I want to point out is one of the disadvantages to measuring food insecurity at the household level, even though it's gotten b better, is that different countries have different ways of measuring it. And within countries, there can be many different surveys that are given that are looking at food insecurity. But what you, in the United States, is this has become the standard to look at this. So it's in numerous surveys. as well as, And as importantly, is it's readily accepted. If somebody says the food insecurity rate in Illinois is amongst children is 20%, that's a readily accepted measure. So that makes it also quite useful. And something else that has been useful in the United States is it's an annual report, both in the United States and in Canada. And this will give you, again, I don't want to talk about the United States, but this will give you some sense about the extent of food insecurity in the United States is that this is for all households, is that even during good economic time, like from 2007 to 2000, 2000 to 2007, a little over 10 percent of Americans are food insecure. This rose rapidly during the Great Recession, and rates really haven't declined much since that recent um, increase. So this is something every year, these things, so United States is we're able to get a fairly good picture about what's happening to food insecurity, and something similar could be done in other countries, including I'm on a project with uh, this funded by the with colleagues at the University of Toronto, was funded by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, where we do work similar methods in Canada you know, as expected, those Canadians have lower rates of food insecurity in most of the uh, provinces, except, ah, Kathy, what's, what's that province up there? What? Nunavut, okay. Yeah, they have really high rates. I think that's predominantly, yeah, so thank you, Kathy. So, um, but other parts where you could see is this, so this gives you, so this is being used in other countries. The exact same method is being used in Canada, Canada for this. 
Okay, but the, the levels don't matter. Well, it matters to the people there, but not for us purposes here. So what I did is, is thought a lot about what happens in terms of the determinants of food insecurity, okay? And so what I did is went through the, we, we have a, for those of you interested, a colleague of mine, Jim Zeliak, and I just wrote a book for the Brookings Institute, institution um, called, uh, I forget what it's called, but it just came out, Future of Children. <laughs> but it's, it's, so if those of you are interested in this, you, you, you know, let me know, I can give you a copy of it. But so there's, I'm going to give you two slides. Is This first slide here is things that you observe in the food insecurity literature that's, in, that's been found in the United States and that has been found in the food insecurity literature in lower income countries. Kashi, this is the work you're doing for me, so thank you. And so he went through this, and they, so these are some of the things that's been found in the United States and in other countries. So that's an, an area of overlap, and you can see these, you can see these, as even some of these are, you know, the household head being an American Indian is not germane for other countries, but this, you know, indigenous status, for example, would, would be, would be something that, that, that are irrelevant. But there's this whole other listing of things these are the characteristics that are more likely to be food insecure that has been found in the United States literature. And I think many of these could be relevant in other countries. So, for example, um, the, uh, so you, well, you can read these, and there's a, there's a lot of them up here. But some of these things is th th that could be relevant in other countries that I think are worth exploring. So at the very least, it may give us some sense about, see, these are some of the things that matter in the United States. Maybe they matter in other countries. Maybe they don't make any difference. I don't know. But in other words, is that we have this pretty rich literature that's looked at this, and some of these things may be, may be relevant in, uh, food, in, in other countries. <laughs> and some of you could say, well, it's already been looked at. But that's Kashi's fault because he didn't find it. No, but no, but, 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 but you should, but I, but I should, you know, so, 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 so it is, um, so, so, but these are some of the things that we might have So we have a really rich literature looking at the terms of food insecurity that could also be, um, applied in, in, in other countries. So that's the first thing I want to talk about is the determinants. Now I want to talk a bit about some of the questions that have been posed that may be relevant in other countries. So for example, one of the key questions in the United States is people with disabilities have far higher rates of food insecurity than households without um, without any with a disability. It's one of the major predictors of food insecurity in the United States. Is if there's somebody with, in a household with a disability, they have much higher rates of food insecurity. So then we talk about some of the reasons why this may matter. That may also matter in low-income countries. And the other thing is, how does the structure of multi-generational families influence um, food insecurity? It's funny, in the United States is households with grand grandchildren and households with the grandparent present, all else equal, are less likely to be food insecure. Be having a grandparent in the household is protective. It's just the opposite for the grandparent. A grandparent with a grandchild in the household is more likely to be food insecure. But, but why? You know, these are the questions. We don't know the answer to these. Now, this is one something that I'm going to talk a little bit about in, in, in lower income countries is, first thing is, is this is a, a, a perplexing thing. In the United States, poverty is not equated with food insecurity, okay? 60% of poor people in the United States are food secure. So the definition of poverty is such that they're supposed to have too little money to be food secure, but in reality is 60% of them are food secure. So it's a question, open question in the literature is, why are so many poor households food secure? The other thing, the converse is also holds, is above households above the poverty line, 10% of them are food insecure. What's going on in these households where they seemingly have enough money is, but they're still food insecure. And I think that that's, this is really a crucial question because you'll see it, and I'm going to show you the next slide, is that at least at the aggregate level, you see something happening in, um, this is a graph that's put forward by the FAO and World Bank. And what this is, is on the x-axis, you have the poverty rate, and on the y-axis, you have the prevalence of undernourishment. Now, as you might imagine, is that as economic growth is a key contributor to the extent of undernourishment. So as countries' poverty rate declines, so too does the rate of food of the undernourishment. That's on average though. Is what you can see though is the enormous variation around that line. So for example, take Ghana. Ghana, which are really, you know, for those of you who've been to Ghana, they're really doing a lot of neat stuff with respect to addressing food insecurity in their country. And therefore they have much rate, lower rates of undernourishment that would, then would be predicted by their poverty rate. Okay. Conversely, for those of you who've been in Nicaragua and seeing how some things are managed there, 
It's not that surprising that Nicaragua has a higher than average under, no, no offense to the Nicaraguans, but they really have some, some stuff going on there, and they have a much higher rate of undernourishment than you might imagine. So this comes back to this notion, at least at the aggregate level, I see something similar in these countries. I was talking about the household level, but we might see something similar. Like, what, what's going on? Why are so many poor people in Ghana food secure, given their poverty rates? Conversely, why are so many people in Nicaragua food insecure despite this? So something, that, something to consider. Um, okay, so now what I want to do is talk about food assistance programs. Is a, more and more countries are putting food assistance programs into place, okay? Including a lot of lower income countries, especially school feeding programs. There's a lot of school feeding programs that have been put in the United States. So the, one, of the core th one of the core things in the United States is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, formerly known as the Food Stamp Program. Its primary goal is to alleviate hunger and improve the well-being of poor people. It's by far and away the largest food assistance program. It is a social safety net for, against hunger in the United States. There's other programs as well. So this is a program that um, I, I, I'm not going to give time constraints. I'm not going to talk at all about, but it's, it serves as the core thing. So what this is, it's available to people of all ages if their income is low enough and if they don't have high enough assets in general. And this is a program that's designed for a lower income house in the United States. Along with SNAP is there's a national school lunch program, school breakfast program, and WIC. For these programs, we have over 40 years worth of studies that have been done on this, okay? We have effects of the program on well-being on both the direct and indirect effect. So this does two things. It first of all points out really how well these programs have worked at addressing various issues, including food insecurity, but it also provides a model of how we want to evaluate these programs in other countries. Most, you know, everybody's, everybody's talking about randomized control trials, randomized control, control trials, those are fine, but there's lots of other ways we can analyze the efficacy of programs, and virtually this entire literature is not based on RCTs, and we're able to get, so some insights can be drawn from this literature about how we want to look at the other things. It also looks at one of the key concerns that we always have about assistance programs is, will it, um, what are the effects of, uh, on labor supply, that a lot of that happens works, and why some people participate, other people don't participate. Despite the existence of this program, a large proportion of people do not participate. So I think that a lot can be learned from this literature in terms of how analyses of these assistance programs are in other countries. So now turning to my last point that I want to make is this quote unquote right to food. A lot of countries in the world that talk about this right to food. and. So, for example, India recently has now have a right to food in their country. But I don't know what that means. I mean, if, you, if, if not everybody can have food, I mean, there's no way not everybody can have food. So what does it mean to have a right that can't possibly, you know, to be implemented? So it's not always clear when a country says, everybody in our country has a right to food. It's not clear what that means. And a lot of countries, when they say there's a right to food, it's, not able, it's almost never able to achieve this. So giving somebody a right... I demand food. Well, yeah, well, you can demand whatever you want. I can't give it to you. So this is the thing is that it's always it's a problem. Like, for the United States, I mean, everybody's always like down in the United States. But you know, we're, 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 we're pretty good. We have this right to food in the United States. De facto and de jure, if I'm not, I'm not using them correctly. But so take SNAP. What does SNAP mean? It's clear what SNAP means, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It means that every low-income person in our country will have enough resources resources to purchase a low-cost food basket. We have a social safety net that addresses food insecurity. Yes, some of the people getting SNAP are still going to be food insecure. We still have food insecure people, but we have a program that's explicitly designed to address this issue. Okay, so de facto we have this. And we also, along with SNAP, we have National School Lunch Program for Children in School, we have a School Breakfast Program for School and Children, we have the WIC Program for Younger Children, we have a lot of other wide array of programs. The other thing is, is United States, we can achieve this. Back to my point earl I made earlier about other countries is oftentimes they're not able to achieve being food security or the right to food. United States, we, we, can, we can achieve this. And this is back to my de facto and de jure. Is de facto, be, right, because in fact it does exist. But all, <laughs> no, that's not what it means. But de jure is, but the thing is, is this is an entitlement program in the United States. So it's de jure because it's an entitlement program. It's written into law that every person who qualifies for this program can access it. Okay? So it's written into law that this is, that this is done. Okay. So that was my, 
I, I have one minute left, but I'm, I'm not going to take that up because I, it's, well, I'm almost done anyway. So that's, I'm done. So um, thank you very much. <laughs> So for, for a couple of questions, and we may have time at the end as well. Any questions out there for uh, Dr. Gunderson? Oh, great. We need a mic. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. So I want to ask you about the nutrition community. So in this country, we have uh, obesity, um, overweight epidemic affecting lower income people, and in many other countries, it's the higher income segments that are affected. And this relates to the lack of nutrition, not lack of food. So how does that relate to your, your comments? So, okay, so I'm spe specifically talking about food insecurity, as, as you noted in your question. I'm not talking about some of these other issues. It is so I guess from the standpoint of this is, we give people the right to a certain amount of food. What people choose to purchase with that food is a separate issue. The government doesn't say, we will give you three stalks of broccoli and two apples and all these other things. That's not the way it's constructed. Instead, it's constructed as a program to make sure people have enough food. So if we want to address some of these other issues, is that's fine, but that's distinct from the food insecurity realm in this context. I mean, you could say, I want nutrition security, and that would be legitimate to say, I want nutrition security. I'm talking about the more narrow thing of food insecurity, which is distinct from nutrition insecurity, at least as food insecurity is defined in the United States, and generally as it's defined in other countries. Okay. Question. Thanks, Greg. Oh, two, oh, she has a question. Yeah, one question. Yeah, Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is what is available for all the, the homeless people that I see around town? So, um, home, homeless persons. So, there's the one thing I didn't even talk about is we have an amazing. Um, informal social safety net for food assistance in the United States through the umbrella organization of Feed in America. There's a whole series of pantries across the country, including in Cham Champaign and, and Urbana that have done some wonderful work at helping out homeless people. Homeless persons, so for example, they would also receive SNAP benefits and there's special criteria for them to receive SNAP. So in principle is that they should be able to receive SNAP. You know, it's structured differently. They can use it at uh, restaurants and stuff, fast food places. Other people can't, but so there's different things for homeless persons, but they, they, are, they are also covered on the social safety net. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thanks. Illinois.